Good, that's pretty good. All right, so right now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, the list. Oh, and you have the term list. You have my term list. Just keep it, keep it. Um, 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 I'll get another one, or I even have one right here. I have one right here. Look at that. Um, and so we're going to go through the last muscles, which are the muscles of the leg. We already touched on it a little bit. The way I do it is always is I, I try to um, bunch the muscles together in a functional perspective, like in groups that do the same thing, like the, what does the muscle do? Since when muscle contracts, it moves bones around, we can, we can, we can kind of do that and get a guide to, through that. So when we look at a hip, one of the things that happens in a hip is, is, is an, all, an awkward movement a little bit because it's actually turning the foot out. So doing that motion here, turning the foot out, happens back in here. Because there's muscles that attach in here, they go to the greater trochanter and when they pull, contract, they pull the foot out like that. They externally rotate. The external lateral rotation group. And there is a bunch of muscle here. You can see there is these muscles here, they are all they're all attached in here. You see, like, this muscle then goes down further, right, in here. So on the model, there's all these muscles are attached in here and then go down. And then they go to the, uh, to the rate of trochander and collectively pull on that. And then that's the external rotation. The one that we studied in the class is the main one, and that's known as the piriformis muscle. And that one goes, actually, well, actually, that one is interesting because it goes to the front of the sacrum. It goes to the front here of the sacrum, and then comes out of here and attaches to the top of the, um, the, the, the greater trochanter. Very, very strong muscle, very powerful muscle, because in our regular anatomy, we talk about it turns the foot outward, but also when you look functionally, what that muscle does is very interesting. It, it, it is on both sides, and on both sides, it comes out like that and holds and holds on to the hip. And, and through that dynamic, what it does, it stabilizes the spine from swaying back and forth to the side. So it always pulls on it. It's like you hold the broom upside down and have to balance it. That muscle does that balancing. So that's a pretty powerful action that's not really described. That's more a functional. We talk about that in massage therapy and in chiropractic stuff when we look at the function. But I find it kind of fascinating. Um, and it's also clinically quite important because a lot of people have a lot of problems with that muscle. And, 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 and the reason why is when you look at, um, I'm trying to use this pen with this thing. I need some regular pen. I need some colors. Or not, I need some regular pen. Trying to change my behavior, hard stuff to do. Um, What was I talking about? I was talking about the piriformis. So when I see it on the anatomy picture here, I see it. Ah, let me get this puppy out. There we go. I see it in here. And you see that yellow thing here? That's the sciatic nerve. And that's what I was trying to say here. The, the sciatic nerve goes right through this piriformis muscle that's laying over it. And when the piriformis is tight, it pinches it. Is that when you get a, a tumulus? Huh? No. It gives you more like a sciatica feeling, more like a nerve firing pattern down the leg. Is that a short horse? I think so. Oh, well then, yeah. When your um, muscle gets strained, Well, you, when you really have a pull, push on the sciatic, what happens? You feel it below the knee. So if you feel a sensation below the knee, like your foot is numb, stuff like that, then that's pressing on that sciatic nerve. If it's just going through this area, then that's usually, it's not, that can be it's all not kind of stuff. It's, no, it's, it's, not it's not a charge. It's not a charge. Okay. <laughs> so that's why clinically that muscle is very important and significant. Because in the old days, you've got symptoms down your foot. The doctors say, hey, it's in your spine. We've got to cut you open and take away the pressure from the nerve. But it could be, and then later on they found that out over time. This is so stiffy. Let's let's dig in this muscle and, and massage this thing real well or inject it with lidocaine or all kind of stuff to relax it, and then the pain of the nerve will go away. That's like, hmm, something there is happening. 
And so that's how they figure those things out over time. And so the piriformis is important for that. Um, uh, when you, you know, just in the class, in terms of the anatomy classes, classically, it turns the foot to the outside. So it's this lateral rotation motion that it does. All right, so that's the first one there, the piriformis. And then we're going to go to a few muscles. We're going to go to some... Well, what are, what are we going to do up here in the hip? We've got to, we've got to be able to do this, raise it up forward, right? We've got to be able to extend, go back. We've also got to be able to bring the hip out. And then if it's out here, you know, this is gravity. That's fine. But if I'm laying on the side, i got something to push it back to the midline. And so i got to have a few more groups here, but mainly those kind of movements. So I have a few muscles that do hip abduction. Abduction is bringing it to the outside. I got the glutes. So we have muscles in the back that do that. The muscles that attach right here, inside here, and go into this part, when you contract those, yeah, that's cool, they do this. That's exactly abduction, that's what we want. So that's the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. This one in here is the main one. And here are the descriptions of the muscles. The other thing, oh, let me um, clear that. The other thing that's interesting about the gluteus medius is the fact that its attachment is from here to here. So let's visualize, and you're raising this leg up here, and you're raising this leg, and you're standing on that leg. Gravity dictates that this hip will fall down. Go like that. You raise this up, it will go like that. But because you've got this gluteus medius here, it can contract and push the hip upward. And instead of this, it can go do this, and it's leveling it out. And so that's a real major job that this muscle has, making sure you don't waddle. When you see somebody walking like that, it might be cute, but maybe that muscle don't work. And then you, you know, because the problem is if you waddle, if you have that amount of motion down here, the stuff wears out. That's one reason why core is so important. That real solid, um, solid foundation here in this part of your body that not everything that you do from the center outward has so much motion that it wears out. Because um, that's what that would do. Excessive motion will create friction, will create more motion on the joint, will create more wear out, that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, that's the gluteus medius and the minimus it's the same thing, it's just deeper down. There is one deeper down that's the, that's the um, medius. Let me see. See here, you see it. You see the gluteus maximus, then the medius is what we talked about just now, and then the minimus is deeper down. It's the same thing, really. It's a little more to the front, but that's fine too, so. Um, then we also have the muscle here, the overlaying muscle over the butt is this one here. It starts more at the sacrum and a little bit at the hip here, and then it reaches down and it goes down to the leg. And it actually goes into this membrane here. And this is a flat tendon. If you touch your side of your thigh, you'll probably feel something on the, on the side that you can rub across. On the model, it's this thing here, this white stuff. And that's a flat tendon. They call that, technically, they call that an aponeurosis. You don't need to worry about remembering that name. Um, but that's what a flat tendon is called. And so we have muscles that pull into that tendon and tighten it up. So basically, it's this muscle and this muscle, and then they share this common tendon that feeds in here. It's just the muscle belly is way up here, and the tendon reaches down, because you can just visualize yourself having a muscle belly out here. That would look kind of weird. That would be kind of weird. So what we do is those two muscles, the front one and the back one, come together, pull on this tendon, and then they help this motion pulling this motion outward. So the front of those is right here, that feeds in, and that's known as the tensor fasciae lata. And the back one, oh wait, that one fell out. The back one fell out. Is this one, that's the gluteus maximus. And the gluteus maximus also does the hip extension. If you think about this muscle, here, pulling here, that's going to bring this hip up, the way it's pulling on this thing, like that. Just this muscle, not both of them. And so that's also, that's the next motion that we have, is just bringing backwards. 
But now we have a few muscles, four of them that can do this. That's kind of cool. And so if we're out here, we're gonna come back and bring it back. So let's look at, let's figure out where the coming back comes in. And that's right here. We have a muscle group that's called the adductors. That's kind of convenient because that's the motion. Bringing the limb back to the midline is adduction. So that's good. Wherever we can get help that you know things work out like that, we're happy. And so these muscles are all here in the midline. Actually, in the back of the thigh, they attach right in here at the linea ospera in the back. And then they feed into the, the sit bone, the initial tuberosity. And some of them go, go from there to the front bone, to the pubic bone as well. So you have this fan of muscle. You got some go, go to the back and some go to the front. So you got this like triangle. So you have a lot of. You know, a lot of that muscle, yeah, it brings a leg back in, but it really, a lot of it is resisting when you do zigzag running and stuff like that. And, 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 and so if you have one going to the front and to the back, you have much more angles that you can accommodate instead of one going to, all of them going to one place. So that's pretty interesting there. The big one, I think, what do we study there from that perspective? We study them, you know, Magnus Longus Brevis. And then we have Gracilis and Pectinius. All of those are adductors if you look on your list. Um, when we come to the testing stuff, though, on this model, I can really see, I can really, you know, I would have to guess which one is which. So it's just adductors is just the one thing. And then, uh, and, and so they start all at the back of the thigh and reach inward medially. Um, and then the most medial one, is, it, is actually this one, and that one is not called an adductor, that's the one that's called the gracilis. So that one is pointed out, so that one I want you to memorize. The one here in the midline, that's the gracilis. Make sure you memorize that, or make sure you know where that is. And then the last one here is the pectineus, it's also on your list, and that's the highest one. That goes right across here, just right across here. And that one is not really visible on this, so I'm not going to test for that, all right? So add doctors and then the gracilis. Make sure you memorize the gracilis. That one's an important one. One time I worked the gracilis really well with an old lady. She was about 87, 6, 7 then, and she was able to walk again after, without a walker afterwards. So it's a very important one. Anyway, so we brought now the hip to the outside. We brought the hip back to the midline. We even brought it back to the back. Now we're going to bring it forward and flex the damn thing. Oh, it's not the damn thing. The nice thing. And so let's see what muscle does do that. Where do you expect those muscles to be that flex the hip? In the front or the back? If a muscle does this, do you expect the muscle to be here or here? Front. Muscle tissue contracts. So if this is a motion, the muscle's got to, this muscle will be lengthening. This will contract. So it's going to have to be in the front. So that's sort of that, you know, that's how you can sort of deduce the stuff and figure out. So the next muscle we're seeing is the one right in here, the one we actually just tested on. It's a muscle that, that's the psoas, so the iliopsoas muscle here. So the iliopsoas. So first we're looking at the psoas. The psoas goes all the way up here and reaches down and crosses the joint right over here. And then you see the iliacus starts in the iliac fossa. You see that name, iliac fossa, iliacus. And then it reaches down to the inside of the thigh right in here. So on the model, this is the bump that goes into, right here, the lesser trochan. And so they, they, they go from here and from here and reach into here. And then when they contract, they pull the leg off. So they flex it. It's also clinic clinically a very important muscle because we sit so much and then it's shortened. So it gets adhesions in there. So one thing is to walk or, or, or do um, uh, lunges, walk in long steps and lunges and feel the, 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 the stiffness in here ease up, then that you will stretch the iliopsoas. You know, and that could be very helpful. And um, these charts, by the way, where these red things are and then these X's, these are trigger point charts that I try to put on every muscle because if you're inclined to work with your hands on muscles and, you know, on friends and family, you know, 
you know, if you're not trained, don't work on strangers. But I, I'm a massage therapist, so I go for these kind of things. If you have a pain in these areas and you work these axes where these muscles are, you really know what you're touching, you can get rid of these pains potentially. Because they have found over the years, long study stuff, the woman who actually did most of that research was John F. Kennedy's personal physician. It was the only female surgeon general we had. And she was, uh, 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 what they did is they injected saline solution into these points, into these trenching points in the muscles, and they found out that pain patterns would seize up. Or if they you know, put irritants in, pain patterns will come back. Um, and so they figured out that we can work. And you can do. You don't have to put in saline solution and flush out the muscle. You can just squeeze the muscle and squeeze all the blood out, and then it has to fill back up with new blood, and that will take care of it too very often. So that's what those are, in case you were wondering. Just in case. And so this concludes sort of what we can do up in the hip for the motion patterns, and then we can get down and go to uh, uh, the knee. And in the knee, we really have two main things that we want to talk about in the knee. We, we have a little bit of rotation, but very, very little. Mostly we have a bending and a straightening out, a flexion and an extension. And so we're going to have muscles in the back. What do you think those do? Flex or extend? That's extension. That's flexion. What do you think this motion is done by these muscles or these muscles? These ones? Yeah. So these in the back here, when they shorten, they pull the knee backwards. So that's the flexion. So those are the hamstring muscles. And I differentiate there a little bit. When we look at the hamstrings, let me find the hamstrings here. Hold on. When we look at the hamstrings, they're all attached at the sit bone. And then they go past the knee into the fibula to tibia, right by the knee, below the knee, right in here. Right in there. So we have muscle, one muscle group, the two muscles each. One muscle group that goes to the inside of the knee, and one muscle group that goes to the outside of the knee. The one on the outside looks like it's one muscle, and it's sort of true, but there is two heads to that muscle. One is just underneath. It doesn't start at the simple, one starts at the thigh. And then it goes down. And you can actually, if you massage people, and you go over here, and it's like rubby. You feel a rubby, you know there's something going on with that muscle. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the right term, but that's how it feels to my head. And then you've got two muscles that go to the inside of the knee. They're right here. And one of they have two different names. One of them is known as the semitendinosus and one the semimembranosus. And this, I don't know, I never really figured out why they came up with these two names. They're kind of weird. But if you look on the side right here, and even here in the picture, this is flatter down here, and this is more stringy. Here is more stringy. This is a little flatter. A tendon, I assume, not true, but I assume a tendon often would be, you know, a thready thing, like a wiry thing. And so that's the semitendinous. It's the one that looks wiry. That's the one on top. Like here is the one on top leg. And the one on the belief, underneath that's wider, that's the semi-membranosis, all right? If you flip those in the test, I'm not going to take points off. Don't worry about that. I'll be okay with that. If you get that far, that's really good. Well, I want to, you know, I want to give you as much as I can because I don't know why. No, because a lot of times these textbooks just explain the stuff so weird that I'm trying to give you as much info as possible so you can take it with you. You know, maybe it helps if you go to opera anatomy classes. But anyway, that's the hamstring. And then from there, we go into what I would consider the quads. So we, 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 we bent the leg. Now we got to straighten it out. I would assume these, right? Kick the, kick the soccer ball. Like, that's very strong muscles. These are the strongest muscle we have in the body. We have four of them. We have, we have, we have four of them. We have one that lays on top, right here. That goes all the way up here, in the hip actually, to below the knee. Everybody goes to below the knee. That's the tibial tuberosity. All of them do that. So this top layer muscle is known as the rectus femoris. It runs by the femur, 
good idea. Erectus, a, a, a muscle around by the femur. Name femoris, you have a place where to, to put it. Again, good reason why I feel very strongly that first chapter, those names of the areas. Go back to those if you study those muscles. Familiarize, use it as a tool to, 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 to imprint some of these names in your head. Because then everything gets easy. It's like you're building a web, but then you can pull on and understand what you're doing. It's a new language. Anyway, that's my lecture on that. So when you take this muscle off, no, you, well, you could, yeah, you take it off. So when I look on this model, I'm going around, I'm taking this top muscle off. That's the rectus femoris. I have an older muscle underneath, right here. And that underneath is the vastus intermedius that starts at the front of the thigh, right on the bone, really strong, and reaches over the knee also and goes into the tibial tuberosity. Everybody goes into the tibial tuberosity. Through the patella. That's in here, the patella. Do not sep do separate the patella from the tibial tuberosity. You can, you can wiggle your patella. No, when it's stiff, when it's, when it's relaxed, you can wiggle your patella. Down here is the tibial tuberosity. You can't wiggle that. If you come up your shin, the first big bump you touch is your tibial tuberosity. Then you go into the patella. And you, that's a round bone. You kind of feel that. Huh? The patella is a bone, yeah, it's that round bone of the knee, it's a kneecap. That's the kneecap. Technically, that's called patella. I actually had a student one, her name was Martina Patella. And she said she got all these orthopedic offers to, she studied medicine later on, I think. Uh, she got all these offers for working for orthopedic sur surgery offices because of her name. And I got outreach, and you know, it's like funny. She was hilarious. Um, Okay, then we got two more muscles there. And both of those muscles are actually starting um, in the back. Where's a good picture? Start at the, at the linea aspera in the back. It's very hard to have a good picture of that. And then what they do is they wrap around the knee and go around and anchor also into the front. So that's pretty... So you can only imagine what it, they can pull really hard when you do that. I mean, that's how strong they are. The strongest muscle we have. Let's see if I take all of this stuff off. Oops. Maybe we now we can't see it. We see that sciatic nerve. That's pretty nice to see it there. That's why when that nerve gets pinched, your whole leg gets numb. But in deep in here, below that, is where these muscles then wrap around and come underneath here, come around here, and on the outside, those are the vastus lateralis on the pinky and medialis on the inside. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Oh my lord. See, the, they gave me the old stuff, which is good. I prefer that. I don't need the new models. Um, okay, so that gives me a knee bending and knee straightening. You you make some sense there with that? Is that helpful so far? Or you got questions on it? You can always ask later too if some things come up. Don't Don't be too... Don't be shy at all about it. Then we go down below to the leg, the calf. Well, actually, that is called the leg because this is, in technical, technical terms, this is the, the, it's called the thigh. That's the thigh and that's the leg. And these muscles, this, this person is not in good shape. Those muscles fall apart. Something is wrong with this. Collagen disorder. Big time. All right, so when I look at the calf stuff, Again, what, what kind of, I'm going to ask myself, what kind of motion do I need to do down in here? If I lift that up and I think, what kind of motion do I need to do here? I need to do a little bit of that, push the toes down, bring it up. A little bit sideways, but that's about it for the most part, right? So I'm going to have a whole bunch of muscles that push the toes down and bring the toes up. And then some that wiggle it a little bit to the side. Um, the... Hold on. The muscles here in the back of the calf are the first one we're going to look at. They are three muscles. There are two outside ones. They're called the gastrocnemius. And they fit from, actually, they start at the lowest part of the thigh and fit all the way to the heel bone, the calcaneus, through this thick thing called the Achilles tendon in the back. You've probably heard of that thing. 
before. Some people break that thing, and that's a disaster. Well, they can recover, but it's, it takes quite a while to recover because these three muscles, the gastroc and then underneath is one called the soleus. They're very strong muscles. They are the ones that, that lift us up. They are the ones that push the toes into the ground so our heel goes up and we can stand on our toe. And, 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 and when you stand on one leg and you lift that, that's your whole body weight with these muscles. You push up. So that's a very strong muscle. That's why they're also called anti-gravity muscles because they push us up against gravity. Gravity goes down. We have so those back of the calf muscles on surface area, the, the more superficial ones, are anti-gravity muscles, making sure we don't buckle on the ca on, on the ankle when for against gravity. Then the muscles here in the front, on the other side, the front side, the quads. Make sure we don't buckle going into our knees. They have to make sure we straighten up straight. That's one reason why they are so big and so strong. They're also anti-gravity muscles. And then the ones in the butt, in the back, they make sure we don't buckle here. So they're also anti-gravity muscles, the glutes. So we got this the anti-gravity muscles here, here, and here. And they are clinically extremely important because if we cannot get out of our chair, we're toast. When people get really old and they can't ambulate, they can't get off a chair, that's really a hard place to be. And so it's very important when you get physical therapy with really old people, a lot of what it is, let's go climb some stairs. Let's make sure these muscles are strong enough that we can keep getting out of bed. Say it again? Wait, I didn't understand. Take the mask off. Sorry. Well, the joint, no, the bone demineralize. So if you don't use your bone in gravity, it's going to demineralize. So it's going to get weak. It could break. When we get old, that becomes a factor. That's one reason why we want to walk. If you lay in the bed too long, not a good idea. It's going to break. So the bone does that. The muscle loses power. If you are sick as a dog in bed for a week, you get up and walk around the block, it's going to take you out. And partly because these muscles, they go, I think they de if you don't do anything, you just lay flat, they decrease 10, 5 to 10% a day. It's tremendous. And they never go completely away because it's always 5 to 10% of what you have left, right? So it, it diminishes of how much goes, but it's crazy. It's a lot, a lot, and then you got to build them up. Once you get in your 50s, you realize you don't go out walking for a few days like, damn, it's hard again. i got to build these muscles back up. I'm like a victim of that right now. It's like, you know, it's hard to keep it up. But, but, but then the muscles also work on the joint. They move the joint, right? And as we get older, the joint also deteriorates because we have a lot of shock waves going in. We have cartilage around the joint. It actually deteriorates sometimes. Or we have trauma. We jump off a real tall building and come down. We don't break the bone, but it jams it so hard that the cartilage gets damaged. And then 20 years later, we have arthritis in there, for example. And then that, that can happen. And the muscles also, the other thing that's interesting is the muscle that's well developed and functions well becomes a shock absorber for the joint. And it's also very interesting. So those are all kind of, you know, food for thought. This is not in the curriculum. Don't worry about it if you didn't get that. Huh? So then the joint Well, the, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, the, the joint always degenerates over time. That is sort of a little bit of fact of life. The joint degenerates more if you're inactive. If you're a couch potato, it goes fast. If you use it and maintain it, see the, the, the cartilage in the joint doesn't have blood supply. And that's the reason why it can't heal fast. It can heal, but it heals through squeezing and unsqueezing. And that's what you do, guess when you walk, you squeeze and unsqueeze these joints in here. If you're just sitting around, you don't squeeze and unsqueeze, so the material inside the joint gets old, used up. And so that deteriorates the joint. The other thing that deteriorates the joint, though, is if you are crazy active, and, you know, you watch some of these people are like ridiculousness, there's those injuries, and you go like, holy cow, how did this person survive? So that's way over the top, right? That, that, that's not good for the joint either, because if you, if you 
have a lot of trauma that goes into this, like a lot of heavy, heavy shock waves versus just your regular walking shock wave, you're also going to have trauma on the that deteriorates too, independent of your activity level. Does that make some sense? I know, sorry. I have to always think about it, so it takes me a while to come up with the answer. <laughs> but anyway, so that's your group in the back here. We can take these off now. See how thick that muscle is? That's huge. This is a well-trained bicyclist. Um, together, those are three muscles, so together they also call them the triceps surrey. And tri stands for three, three muscles. That's the same back here. Triceps brachii, triceps surrey. This term... It's really here for you guys to go like, when you read a book and you go like, triceps surrey, what the hell, I haven't heard of that one. Because it's very rare that you see them put together as a unit. Um, okay, and then when we take this apart, this away, we end up having three compartments that I want to talk about in the leg. And they are real compartments. They are made with membranes that separate these parts. Like one membrane is between the tibia and then this here behind here, the fibula. And it's very thick, separates the front from the back, and then we have one on the side. Uh, when we look at the, we, let's look at the front and the back first, because those are very similar. So when we look at the front of the leg, we think about, this is the right leg, we think about muscles in the front, what would those do? Would those raise your toes or push them down? Raise your toes or push them down? Raise, raise them, right? They're here, they pull. When they contract, that goes up. They pull here, they pull the toes this way. And so those muscles will either dorsiflex, is the term in the foot, they don't use extension and flexion. They use dorsiflexion for pulling them up and plantar flexion for pushing the toes into the soil. They're planting in the soil, so they call that plantar flexion. So the muscles go on the top of the, fore, of the leg, the outside here, oh, it's this one. God, they always change the stuff. Hold on, let me put this muscle back in. Here we go. Because I destroyed it. There you go. So these muscles here, they pull the toes up. They are, we have three of them. We have one that goes to the ankle, right by the tibia. tibia. So that muscle is called the tibialis. And you see it goes right to here. So it goes to the ankle, pulls the ankle up sort of this way. All right, and then we got two more. We got one here. You look at that, it goes right to the toes. And then we got a sliver that comes out of here and it goes to the big toe. So we got the green one, but then see we got the red one that goes to the toes, and then we got the purple one that goes to the big toe. This is very similar nomenclature than in the hand, in the forearm. Extensor digitorum longus. It extends, now these, See the motion, the motion on the on the on the ankle is plantar flexion down, dorsiflexion up. But when you get to the toes, they gotta use again extension and flexion. I know they're crazy, right? But we gotta go with it. See that because um, because then see here again you use the word extensor. Digitor means toes, digits. And then long, long as there is a smaller one underneath. Because you got so many. Joints, the toes you have as many joints as in the hands, and they all have to individually be able to bend. So you've got actually more than just the muscle we're starting. You've got more underneath. And then the purple one here goes to the big toe, and the big toe's name in Latin is halicus. Halicus. Some people who have a lot of heels on, their toe ends up bending to the outside this way. They call that a halix valgus. The hallux name, if you see the word hallux, you're thinking of a big toe. And so that's that last one in the front, the extensor hallucus. And that's this one coming in here. Then when we turn the leg to the back, we have the same makeup. It's just in the back. So instead of dorsiflexion, now it pushes the toes down. It plantar flexes everything. So we also have there a tibialis. We have it not only in the front, we have it in the back. It's called the posterior, not the anterior. And then we got, instead of extensors, we have two flexors. We got a, the, pushing the toes down again is plantar flexion or pushing the, 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 
the foot down, but when you look at the muscle names, we're using the word flexion. We have one that goes to the digits, that's the longest. We have, I mean, the digitorum. And then we got one that goes to the big toe, that's the halicus. I'm not testing these on the test in the back because they are a little weird. Because the one right by the bone, easy peasy, that's the tibialis. We're good with that. But then, when you look here, and I'm not even going to the model, you see the digitorum goes here, and actually, it starts on the side where the big toe is, but it crosses over inside, and you can't see that. All right? And so that's it. I'm just telling you that in case you get confused. You go like, what the heck is this about? And then the same is happening with the, flat, with the one for the big toe. It starts on the outside where the pinky toe is, and it crosses over and actually reaches into the hallux. So it's like a bit goofy. Okay? So don't worry about memorizing this. Do the best you can in labeling it because then you have that first time around with these muscles. Um, we have many more muscles in the foot, but the, in, the, in the calf, we have one last compartment left, and that's the outside compartment. And that's the lateral compartment. And the muscle we have there is the fibularis muscle. And that's this one on the outside, on the model. And that muscle, the fibularis, is attached on the fibula, that's the name, fibularis, and it's attached on top all the way down to here. So it's the whole length where it's attached. There's three parts to it, which is where, which is mean, call it the fibularis. But when you go and dissect it out further, you have three parts. You have a big part on top, the longest. Then you have a smaller one coming up, the brevis. Brevis means small or, or short. And then you've got a smallest one underneath. They don't even label it here. Right here it's labeled. It's the tertius. It's very small. You don't even need to never worry about memorizing that one. But you know, then we have it heard once. But the interesting thing is that muscle goes, the longest, goes all the way underneath the foot and attaches on the inside, on here. It's here, goes here, goes all the way underneath and attaches in here on the foot. So when we twist our ankle, we turn the ankle outward, right? Most people don't go this way. They mostly go this way. So we twist our ankle. This muscle here going underneath, when that contracts, it pulls the ankle this way. So it can help prevent twisting the ankle. Does that, can you visualize that? Like when it contracts, it makes shortens, right? So it pulls this part upward a little bit. And so that prevents this motion from happening. And so it, the fibularis, really, what it really does, it prevents the foot from rolling outward. We have ligaments here, but number one, a lot of us have these ligaments a little twisted and broken and lengthened. And so this muscle has to do extra work. And also, um, it reinforces the ligaments too, especially for rapid firing. And you will also know if you have twisted your ankle real bad, this is going to get heck of sore. Then you know this muscle is working really hard. Or at least it's trying. Good. All right. That's all that I think we have with that. Is that sensible so far? Yeah? That, do you think that helpful? Give you some more tips? Integrates it a little more for you guys? Yeah? Perfect. No, I think too. I think the classroom is important for these things. Uh, you, know, you let me know if it's superfluous. And then.